Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome to Live in London. I'm your host, Mosin Shah. We'd like to congratulate you on the upcoming Eid, inshallah, Eid al Ghadir, and make sure you have a fantastic and excellent spiritual evening, inshallah, celebrating Imam Ali, the gate to the city of knowledge. And many of us would like to gain more knowledge. Some of us would like to gain knowledge on tafsir, gain knowledge on Quranic sciences, knowledge on theology, ethics. But how does one start this journey? Where should one begin? Can one do it here in the UK or must we pack our bags and go over to Najaf or Qum to study Islam? What is the correct near to begin with? Are we going to gain a spiritual benefit or are we just trying to learn words so that we can you know, repeat like a parrot on a pulpit? And how do we know where to study, what to study, what sort of books to go for? Are we ready, mentally ready to go for this? Inshallah, we'll discuss this and a lot more through my own experiences at Hosa, where I was on a similar journey, where I was taught a subject known as Sarf Enahu. Very, very difficult, very, very challenging. But later I understood the importance of this and why this is necessary to learn in my journey. And Inshallah, we'll discuss my journey and also Dr. Amar Naksrani's journey. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah. Very well, very well. Thank you. Mashallah. Doctor, let's begin with Islam. And its position on gaining knowledge? Well, I think when you're looking within the Holy Quran, which I believe, you know, is the base for our worldview and the importance of learning and building that relationship with our Creator, the first words, one may argue, to be revealed to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family are words which very much relate to learning, very much relate to education. When we see the word iqra, read, it's highlighted that we wanted to build a community of people who read, which in turn becomes people who are people of knowledge, in turn people of wisdom, in turn people who are able to reflect on their own heritage and the heritage of those who exist around them. Sadly, in the Muslim world, I think we've become a community which may be titled the community of La Naqra. We don't read. There are many households in the Muslim world where either people want to learn, want to read, but don't know where to begin. Or there are those who really won't pick up a book at all. They'll say, really, their Islamic lifestyle is more of a following of a particular culture than a following of a religion. In the sense that if you ask them, have you sought to read about the heritage of your religion, the teachings of your religion, understand if we may call it the highway code that God provides for us, you'll find that there are many out there who will make excuses for why they don't read, even though they're willing to read on many other things in their life. And sometimes things which are important, sometimes things which are mundane. Then there are others out there who you'll find there is no culture of reading which is established in the household. There isn't, for example, a separate room full of books. There isn't a culture which is established in the house where the father or the mother are constantly reading. So when you're looking within the Holy Quran, you've got this presented to us with the first word which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family is told to recite is the word Iqra. And then... The second chapter to be revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, is titled Qalam. And Qalam, as we know, means pen. pen. So there is this focus from the very beginning of Islam in the Meccan period on reading as well as writing. That if you really want to gain closeness to your Lord, 
then your abilities and these gifts that you have to be able to read and to be able to write. You know, there are people in the world who cannot read or write. There are people in the world who wish they could read or write. Sometimes the biggest embarrassment for the human being is when that human being says, I'm sorry, I just don't know how to read or I don't know how to write. And it's sad when we see that certain parts of the Muslim world are full of people who are illiterate. When a religion began with a focus on reading and a focus on the tools for learning such as writing. Then you've got these traditions which highlight to us that your culture may tell you learn up until a certain age but this religion wants you to continue gaining knowledge until your grave. So when you see a tradition for example like seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. grave. It doesn't say seek knowledge from the cradle to 16. If you look at some of our madrasa systems in the communities in the West, for example, our, you know, the founding fathers of our community in the UK or in, you know, in North America, for example, in Australia, they, they worked so hard to try and have at least one day a week where we could gain knowledge about our heritage, about, you know, even our culture. But you find that many of us left those schools at 16 and many of the challenges of life came at 16. And so for many people, they assume that you seek knowledge from the cradle till you're about 18. And then after that, if you can pick up the odd book, pick it up. And that's sad. And that's sad. The religion of Islam shows you through many of its tenets, many of its traditions that try and continue to read about those who came before you, learn the lessons from their lives and try and also learn about the lives of those personalities who were the very gates to the city of knowledge. When we see the Holy Prophet peace be upon him his family saying, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate. That Medina is a Medina, a city of ilm. And that man, his greatness is that you have to go through him to get to me. But their focus is that they're able to provide you with ilm on every issue possible. You want to ask them about law, they'll give you an answer. You want to ask them about theology, they'll give you an answer. You want to ask them about ethics, they'll give you an answer. You want to ask them about how spiritually you can grow, they'll give you an answer. So without a doubt, the religion of Islam wanted its followers to be people who are constantly yearning to gain ilm. And hopefully from the world of ilm, you move towards the world of hikmah, wisdom and applying what you have learned. Just a quick reminder to our viewers that this is a live show. And if you have a question that you'd like to ask to say it, Please call us on 0203 515 or alternatively, you could uh, WhatsApp us. The number should be there at the bottom. Sayyidna, the Quran is like the source of knowledge. And surely we should be taking knowledge from the Quran. Do you feel that like our community has kind of neglected the Quran and has, has neglected gaining and taking advantage of this book? I think the, uh, the Quran itself mentions that there will sadly be a group of people who will not take full advantage of this book. If you look within the Quran, either in chapter 25, verse 30, for example, where there is a complaint from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, that people are not, uh, have, you know, people have abandoned the Quran. And I think in many Muslim households, if we're going to put it very frankly, many people don't enjoy reading the Quran. And that's partly due to the fact that we haven't explained the wonderful wisdom that emerges from learning the Quran. But naturally also a person has to take the first step. You can't be spoon fed everything. You have to take time out to try and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm going to start reading some pages of the Quran, but illuminate my heart so that I'm able to understand it. And when I mention illuminate, because ilm and nur go hand in hand, that knowledge that you gain is no doubt a light from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A light that allows you to um, be away from the world of darkness. A light that allows you to be guided towards that which is, um, that which allows your growth and allows you to actualize your potential. And so the Quran itself and the abandonment of the Quran is constantly spoken about by the Holy Prophet peace be upon him and his family. But I think one beautiful message when we're looking within the Quran, is that the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran themselves are constantly striving to gain more knowledge in relation to God's creation, in relation to God's wisdom. 
You'll never find a prophet within the Holy Quran except that they, he's on a journey of illumination, a journey where they're seeking to find knowledge that will bring them higher levels of wisdom. And probably the most beautiful example in the Quran is when we're looking at someone like Nabi Musa alayhi salam and his interaction with Khidr alayhi salam. That interaction shows you a prophet of God who constantly, even though he's defeated Pharaoh, even though he's spoken to the Lord, even though he's achieved everything, because sometimes you can reach a level where you think, you know what, I've, I know everything. Or you've read a couple of articles, I'm very knowledgeable. Or you read a couple of books and you're on a high that, you know what, I've read a couple of books, I know a few long words and therefore I, I pretty much know everything about the subject. And that's the beginning of your downfall. Because the person with true knowledge is someone who will admit that they don't know everything. And I think what happens with Nabi Musa and that story is that there's a message to the reader of the Quran that even though I'm one of the Ul al Azm, I still myself am trying to gain more knowledge and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me gain that knowledge. And that's why many of us will say, and I always say this line before I go up to give my lectures. Rabbi zidni ilma. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please increase my knowledge. I know that my knowledge can increase through my personal endeavors. But the light for me to be able to understand a concept quicker, sharper, the many layers behind a word or a concept. That is a light that I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shine in my heart. I can never myself reach a level like Qarun did in the Quran and never do I want to reach such a level where I arrogantly say if someone asks me where did you gain all this knowledge from? Oh, it's all my hard work. No. Ultimately, it is a light which is placed in our hearts by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when we're looking within the Quran, the Quran has to be that first place we begin. Arabic grammar, you can find a lot of its laws Quranically. Hmm. Ethics and absolute universals, concrete universals within the Quran. Theology within the Quran. There's law, verses of law, some say 80, some say 500 within the Holy Quran. History and the knowledge of prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their life stories within the Quran. Quran. So when there are many people out there saying, provide me a book. Is there any good book out there for me to study right now? You've got the book on your shelf at home. Don't just bring it out in weddings and funerals. Very yeah. enlightening, may I say. Um, excellent saying that. I mean, I do feel that with, with the Quran, we have neglected it as a community. And some of us actually like, we need to learn how to read it properly and actually extract the knowledge that's there. And mashallah, Sayyidina, you talked about your intention in regards to uh, gaining more knowledge and being more quicker and faster and understanding theories and concepts quicker. Is this the, 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 you know, the initial intention one should have when trying to seek Islamic knowledge? I mean, when I started with my Hawza, my intention was, uh, you know, I, I wanted to, first of all, I, I love the religion, I love learning. There, there's a thirst for, for knowledge, as Imam Ali quotes, that the thirst for knowledge is, is phenomenal. And also I wanted to help my community if I could, and those younger than me. Um, what would you suggest for someone who wants to go out and, and learn Islam? What is the correct intention to have? I think that the ultimate intention is to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To gain closeness to the Creator. I'm not studying this subject because one level of intention may be those who are studying this to show off that I've learned a few long words and I, for example, know about a certain area. And I'm going to tell you about how much I know. And I'm be condescending towards you to show you that really you don't know as much as I do. Then there are others who may go out to study knowledge because they're thinking that's the only career path I have left. I'm a dropout from <laughs> high school. I'm a dropout from college. I'm a dropout from university. Let me pack my bags and go somewhere where I'll study. And who will know any better if I've studied there for a couple of years or I was there for six years but I've studied for two or I was there for eight years but I've studied for four. I'll come back and I'll be wearing the holy garb. And if I come back and wear the holy garb then there'll be a lot of people out there for example who will not know any difference. So you have people whose intentions are what? 
their intentions either for popularity, then there are others, their intentions that this is a last resort. Let me learn the laws of istikhara and talaq and nikah and mayit and come back. There must be communities that will accept me. But the highest level are those who seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why they ultimately go and gain that knowledge. If we believe that, for example, let's say we study sharia ah and we study man's interpretation of sharia, ah, say in the world of fiqh, ah, jurisprudence. When we study this, it's because I want to delve deep into the highway code of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was the reason behind this law? When was it actualized? I know that all these laws ultimately are for my sa'adah, for my, and ultimately my bliss, my happiness at the end. So I want to learn about these laws. I want to also learn the methodology behind how we derive these laws so that I can impart some of that knowledge back towards community members who were not able to necessarily go and study these subjects. But when I'm studying law or I'm studying history, is it so I can tell people the facts and figures of a story or the facts and figures be behind how we derive a law? Or is it so that I can begin to implement the lessons from this in my life? If I go, for example, to study jurisprudence, when I'm studying the chapter on Tahara, for example, Am I studying it so that I can tell people that I know words such as hadath and khabath <laughs> and istinja and, uh, you know, and for example, istibra and I can tell you, if, well, you know, if a lady is in her, in her menstrual cycle, these are the following laws and this is the three to ten day period and a lady in nafas is the laws and this is the laws of istihada and this is the laws of tayammum. Am I gaining that knowledge? So that I'm able to tell people that, look, I've studied this chapter inside out, or will I actually apply that knowledge to my life? Because in applying that knowledge to my life, I find that I'm gaining closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his lutf and through his rahmah, through his grace and through his mercy, has provided me with wonderful treasure chests of knowledge in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the lessons from the lives of the Imams of Al-Muhammad I'm studying these, why? I'm studying these so that I can show off to people that I have so many letters next to my name or I'm studying these so that I can help develop my relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and also build my community in turn. So you will find in history there are those who gain knowledge. But was there knowledge of avail to them? Like when we hear about that scholar from the children of Israel, um, I think his story is mentioned in the Quran, I think chapter 7 verse 175. Um, that scholar had that knowledge but was not practicing that knowledge. But he could show off that knowledge. Then there are those, no, they, they go and gain knowledge. Their intention is, Ya Allah, I want to get closer to you. You love those who, gain, who seek knowledge. And you praise the ulama, that they are the ones who have this khushu when they remember you, O oh Allah. So I want to be amongst those ulama. I want to see how I can reach a level where I am able to gain closeness to them, to Ahlul Bayt, in turn closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Excellent, Sayyid. Sayyid, now, let's take, you know, an example here. Let's take a person called Ahmed. Ahmed now has a choice between going to Najaf or Qom or doing a degree. Now, what, you know, can we actually expect our youth to give up a Western academic education uh, before they go to Qom or Najaf or Hawza in any other country? Well, it's an amazing opportunity if a person is able to go and study in the holy land of Najaf or the holy land of Qom. It really is an amazing opportunity. But each situation is different. I believe that our youth who are 16 years old, 17 years old, 18 years old in this country, they have access to a wonderful secular education system. And I think if you finish your degree, 
at one of the universities, let's say in the UK or the US. After that, you want to go to Qom, you want to go to Najaf, at least you have a degree to fall back on. So you may go to Qom or Najaf, for example, for a year. And at the end of that year, you may say, I want to stay here longer. If you want to stay there longer, fantastic. If you don't want to stay there longer, then you've got something to fall back on. My humble advice would be that if they are able to get themselves a degree in this country, and even if it's an Islamic studies degree here from a prestigious university over here, or a prestigious university in North America, or a prestigious university in Australia, get that basic degree, which I believe you are blessed to be living in a country where you're able to go to university. Many of our parents had to leave university because of war. Many had to leave because of very hard political times. If you're able to be in a position where you can study, say you want to do pharmacy, say you want to do engineering, study those subjects, then after that make a decision, go to Qom or go to Najaf. If you go to Qom or Najaf, you've got something to fall back on anyway. You may come back towards that career path, or you may continue to study over there. What's wrong with doing the Hawza first and then going to do the degree? I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And fall back on the Hawza. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, sometimes going to Hawza at a young age randomly without really having family in these countries mm -hmm. can be a daunting experience. There are people out there who went to these countries um, at a young age, they came back broken. There are some who went at a young age, they'll say to you, yeah, I went at that young age, nothing happened to me. Yeah, but you've got about maybe 500 cousins in that house. Or you've got 100 of your friends there. Or you've got family members who live within the vicinity. It's not like me who's going to Najaf and I have nobody I don't know anyone in, in Shara Zain al Abidi. I don't know anyone in Shara al Sadr. I don't know anyone when I go towards the Wilaya area or I go, you know, a bit outside. If you go to Qom, I'm talking for those who maybe are at a very young age. In no way we're discrediting it, in no way we're telling them not to. But I would think if you're able to establish your education here in this country, it also may provide you with certain methodological tools which are going to be valuable when you go there. Definitely. You know, the, the ability, you see, sometimes I think when you finish a degree, I find this on my own experience, when you finish a degree, I don't know whether it was the degree that was important or more the fact that I could tell myself that you can get through this struggle. Because none of us want to finish it. Half the time you want to chill, you want to, <laughs> you know, kick back. Um, so and then last year, you'll procrastinate right at the end and try and get a grade. But I think what, what it was telling you is, you know what, you can be in here for the long haul. I think that willpower is needed when you go to Qom or to Najaf. Yeah. Just a quick question, a personal question. You were saying that, you know, uh, sometimes it's unfortunate that someone has, um, you know, hasn't really succeeded in academia and just falls upon Hawza as a last resort to gain some sort of respect or status. Yes or no, is Hosa the level that you study at, very, very challenging, and is it for academics? So what I'm trying to ask you is, who, who is the perfect candidate to go to Hosa or to go into Islamic studies and, and do well and progress and succeed? Well, I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us all with different abilities, with different, um, different levels of even understanding and learning, different backgrounds that we came from. I think it makes a difference if, you're, if your father and your grandfather, for example, are alive and they're able to sit with you and you said discussing Nahu and Sarf. I don't know if you discussed that at home when you were a kid, <laughs> but if you've got your grandfather sitting in front of you discussing Nahu and Sarf or talking with, you know, Nahu and Sarf type, you know, uh, principles or then telling you, okay, let's discuss the Quran and the tafsir of the Quran. I think that helps as an introduction. Um, I think there are certain people who are bright enough to go to Oxford and there are others as hard as they try, they won't go to Oxford. So when these two both go towards Qum, there's already one who's a bit sharper Definitely. than the Definitely. other. However, when they both get there, it's sometimes not only about sharpness. Yes, it it's a, plays a major role. You'll find in later jurisprudential discussions, 
It can be the difference between being a mujtahid and not. It okay. can be the difference between the highest marja versus another marja, that sharpness and ability to understand a particular concept. But I think hard work pays off. I think success in, in the hawza is about how much reading you do outside of class. I think, you know, the mubahatha, which is probably the best part in my own experience, um, in my years at Hausa, the best experiences were when you're sitting discussing with your fellow classmates or yeah. classmates and you're grappling on this issue. And then one of them doesn't explain it to you, but then another one you're like, ah, now I get it, thanks. I, I, you know, I can understand it. Or you buffer off each other. Did you understand that concept? Did you pick up that reference? You know, I think outside of class, there are those who outside of class try and do some reading. There are others who will go and sit in the libraries when others may be chilling. Um, and they're the ones who may not have been bright enough to go to Oxford, but the hours they're putting in has a profound effect. Yeah, the hard work definitely pays off. From my experience, I, I, I found Hosea very, very academically challenging. I thought it was almost as doing a degree. It was at the same yeah. academic level. Now, Sayyidna, you've studied both in the West and in, in Hosea and in, in traditional Islamic seminaries. What would you say are the differences between the two? And, and, you know, a little bit more about your experience, you know, studying Islam here in the West and, is, and studying in the East as well. Well, I think when I studied Hausa, one of the, the greatest feelings was having the shrine of a holy personality just down the road. That made a big difference. You know, to be able to go and sit by the grave of a family member of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family is a wonderful experience, a wonderful feeling. Um, and some people may think, well, what difference does that make? Books are books, a library is a library. But many ulama will tell you that their personal relationship with a member of the Ahlul Bayt buried in the vicinity of where they're studying has an inspirational effect, has a motivational effect. Because there's that moment when you're thinking, I'm not really bothered for all of this. I just want to go home. You know, my boys are all back at home and they're all chilling and I'm alone over here. And I literally remember when, you know, where I was, I was in some cases... Uh, alone, you didn't really have a friend circle as such, you more had acquaintances and that maybe helped me put my head down and was probably the reason I chose where I wanted to study in, in the Middle East. Um, I think likewise when you're looking Hausa wise, you've got specialists who have, st who have studied that text and taught it for many years. Um, and I think the Hausa curriculum is a fantastic curriculum. It's open for reform. It's gradually you'll see different reforms happening. But I think one thing you learn in, in the Hausa, and I hope everyone experiences this, but I know that not everybody does. And that is sometimes the akhlaq of your teacher is as if not more valuable than his ilm. Um, one of my teachers, may Allah bless him, and I hope he's in a good way at the moment, he, uh, he'd teach me, and then he'd say, why don't you come home for lunch? Now, he doesn't have to say that to me. I don't know many people in the academic world who say to you, listen, come over for lunch. He'd be like, listen, here's my hours, 11 till 1. You're more than welcome to come. But... After one, you may see me again um, in four days' time between 9 to 10. When you have somebody in a seminary-type environment, whether it's a Muslim seminary, a Christian seminary, a seminary of other faiths, who says to you, come home, sit, let's have lunch, is showing you it's not just about the knowledge that you gain. It's also about your people's skills and your humility that grows with that. There are many out there who have ilm. But believe you me, you see their behavior, cla lacking class, condescending, because th their ilm is purely to show off, it's nothing more. But then, 
at Hausa, that experience is a wonderful experience because there's more of a relationship with the teacher. Uh, academically, I believe that it opens new horizons because in many cases, the person who's discussing Islam with you <clears throat> is a non-Muslim professor. So he's not looking at Islam from the same lens that you look at it. When I look at Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib um, in the Hawza, the teacher will say, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa yes. Whereas the professor at a Western academic institution will say, so Ali said to, for example, Which Salman. Mm, no sallallahu alayhi wa yeah. And nor is he looking through the theological lens. Nor are they looking through um, the pious hagiography hey, lens that we look through. Because the pious hagiography hey, is we want to make sure that, you know what, these anecdotes and these stories, you know, they give a buzz to the student when you're giving it in the Hawza, that, you know what, this is what Wilaya is, this is what Amir al-Mu'min is, this is what Ahlul Bayt is. Your non-Muslim professor will not necessarily take these hagiographical hey, or anecdotal stories, you know, they'll say, well, it possibly could have happened. However, I'm a bit skeptical about it. Maybe skepticism becomes the norm in the, in the academic world. But that's not necessarily a negative because that keeps you on your toes. And it allows you to reflect that, well, how do I look at this from a different angle? How do I look at this text objectively? How do I look at this text from the angle of somebody who is not part of the tradition, unlike me who is within the tradition trying to elaborate on a concept. Um, and one great thing I would say about the academic world is that they'll say to you, listen, you want to prove your knowledge on this area, write 100,000 words on it. PhD, for it's example. And when they're telling you write 100,000 words on that subject, they're telling you so that when you come out of this university, we can verify that you actually knew your stuff, you studied, and so on. And um, you're able to quote all the journal articles on this area and so on. So I think both of them, there's, you know, there's positives in both of them which we can benefit from. Yep. Fantastic saying that. Which brings me on to my next question, which I was going to ask you was, what, what do you think about studying in the West under non-Islamic uh, you know, teachers and scholars? I mean, you know, to, to take ilm from them, it's okay. It's acceptable. Some of the some of the best works I've ever read on Shi'i law, on Shi'i ethics, on Shi'i theology, on Shi'i history have been by non-Muslim academics. For me, to name the likes of Wilfred Madlung, Ethan Kohlberg. Uh, Robert Gleave, Linda Clark. I look at their works on Shi'i thought and Shi'i heritage, whether it be in the areas of Shi'a history or Shi'a theology or Shi'a law. Fantastic works which I'm able to benefit from. And I believe there was a tense period between the, academ the academic and the traditional, which I think now people are slowly starting to overcome that tension. The Hausa was always skeptical about the academics. And some of the academics were always skeptical about what the Hausa is producing. And I believe both of them have produced great minds. But if you're asking me, is there an issue with me learning? No. I'm gaining knowledge. I'm looking at how to study the text. I'm looking at texts which hitherto that point I didn't even know existed. When I read Madelung or I read Kohlberg, I'm seeing some fantastic analysis. My supervisor for my PhD, one of them was C.E. Bosworth, non-Muslim. Fantastic mind, brilliant texts. Doesn't mean that he has to agree with me on everything. I have to agree with him on everything. Even when we're looking within our houses, there are maraj who differ on certain issues. 
And likewise, in academia, I could differ with my teacher. But can I reject the fact that that teacher had studied texts inside out and taught me how to study them? No. That teacher was a major influence. And when I look at these names and see the works that they produced, you know, Andrew Newman, Linda Clark, um, uh, you know, Ethan Kohlberg, Wilfred Madlung, Robert Gleave. And there are others out there who I can mention, fantastic works. You know, you look at, for example, Sabina Schmidtke and her analysis of someone like Alam Al-Hilli. Phenomenal piece. You know, she's at Princeton. But look at the brilliant work that she's done. You know, Professor Robert Gleave, you look at the brilliant work that he's done when it comes to Usul al-Fiqh. But say, don't you think that these uh, academics may be, um, you know, um, challenged and because they don't have a, um, an Arabic background and they don't get their, you know, direct, their sources direct from the Arabic text, On, aren't they limited? In some cases, their Arabic is better than mine and yours put together. Oh, wow. Don't, you know, sometimes our people... When they hear these names, they imagine these people, because they are from a Western background, have not studied Arabic. Arabic is open for everyone to study. Like French is open for everyone to study. Spanish is open for everyone to study. Th these scholars, you see the way they talk about the syntax, or they talk about morphology. They talk about it like it's their bread and butter. Some of them had to leave their homes for a year or two to go and study in Cairo, in Damascus, in Qom. So that they were able to gain a grasp of the Arabic or the Persian and its origin. So let's not have this condescending view that, well, this person's English or this person's American or this person's German. Therefore, they have no understanding of the Arabic language. In some cases, the way they talk about the Arabic language um, makes us really reflect who the Arab is. Yeah, that's it. Inshallah, we'll be going to a break now. Please join us after the break and we'll continue this discussion. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask the Sayyid, you can call us on 0203 515 Or alternatively, you can get us on the WhatsApp. The number should be at the bottom. Inshallah, we'll continue the discussion after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Live in London. Today we're discussing Islam and its knowledge and how to begin studying Islam. We've discussed having the right intention, we've discussed the benefits of studying abroad and also studying here in the West. So now my next question is, we know we have Hosa abroad, but we also have Hosa in the West as well. Do you think this is, uh, you know, good enough for us to go and study? Is it, you know, uh, a credible? Well, my first few years in, in Hausa were, were here in, in the UK and, um, and the teachers I had were amongst the best teachers Najaf and Qum has produced. Uh, the only difference was they decided to come and teach in London and, um, and I'm indebted to these teachers. You know, um, to have a teacher like uh, Ayatollah Sayyid Fadl al Milani is, is an honor. You know, this is one of Ayatollah al khuis students. Uh, this is a person who people can emulate. You know, a person who knows his texts inside out. Speaks good English as well. Speaks fantastic English, uh, Arabic, Persian, Turkish, you know. But you know, to be able to study under such a person has a major influence on one's life. Now, I, I'm sure he wishes that, you know, the oppressive era of, uh, of the Ba'ath party in Iraq was never there and that he was still there and he's able to teach and he's able to continue to spread and disseminate knowledge. But, you know, certain issues dictate that you have to move towards pastures new. 
So to study under someone like that here in London is a huge honor. You know, to study under uh, other great teachers, may Allah bless the soul of, of Sheikh Ilmi. You know, uh, he was a brilliant teacher for us in Quran. Uh, Sheikh Ahmed Vaizi was a brilliant teacher for us in Usul al-Fiqh. Uh, so all of these are renowned names in their own area. But to be able to study under them. I don't care if I'm in London or I'm in, in Qom. While they're here, I'm going to try and get as much as I can from them. Like I said earlier, there is a difference when we're in Qom or in Najaf next to, the, you know, to that beautiful spiritual surrounding uh, in some parts of the day. Of, uh, of say the Masuma or Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, you know, when you hear of the great scholars of Najaf and their relationship with Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, it, it, was, it was really there for us to understand that, you know, uh, that spiritual side gives the illumination to the heart with those books that you are reading. Uh, so if there are Western houses now, and there are, you know, in London, in, in, in Chicago, you have a house and other parts of, the Western world, you are seeing houses. These are mainly with, you know, teachers who are brilliant teachers, teachers who know their subject, and teachers who also will invite you to go on to study in Qom and Najaf. They're not stopping you. Mm. There's no one in these houses who's saying to you, you can't go to Qom and Najaf if you study here. On the contrary, they'll tell you if you want to do your further reading, your further studying, then go towards Qom and Najaf. But here in the West, do you think it's difficult to emulate that Hausa environment? For example, um, the uniform. In the West, you're not going to see people wearing abayas and qaba and, and, and turbans. Or, or is it the Why are you so concerned with uniform? You know, <laughs> I can get you rosary beads if you want. <laughs> um, and I can also get you a, a dishdasha that hasn't been ironed for about six weeks. You know, these are things which we can make available to you. Um, as well as abaya if you want that as well. But I'm really more concerned with your, definitely your akhlaq first and foremost. Um, not that you look like a dervish or something, that really doesn't really concern me, or that you walk like someone who's a, you know, a agnostic or something, really doesn't interest me once or whatsoever, or that you're a person who's left the dunya, therefore you've decided to stink, you know, even that doesn't interest me. <laughs> what interests me is um, in mubahatha, how we're both able to support each other, discussing different topics, but also in, in difficult times, being there for each other. For someone to turn around and tell me, well, walking around and looking at people who are dressed who are dressed in a certain way then that bahlul anecdotal example of you know tell them if they want they want me or they want my tasbih and they want my abaya you know which one do you want which one are you more interested in um and how many how many are in the clerical wonderful garb but cover many a, a dark secret um so you know, if you're telling me that that is a hindrance, I don't think that's a hindrance. Um, I think definitely if you're on Qom and Najaf, there's going to be a lot more people you can have that mubahatha with. You know, you could go to the haram of Imam Ali alayhi salam at 2 a.m. and see people sitting down studying, you know, uh, the great works of someone like, let's say, Sheikh al-Mudaffar. Yeah. Um, but you will not see that in London necessarily, that at 2 a.m. there's going to be a house that's open where people are studying sitting in a, in a halaqa, for example, and start discussing, you know, Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr's halaqat. That may not be there. Yeah. Say that it's 2018. Can we study Islam in terms of like distance learning, online, YouTube seminars and stuff? Well, yeah, but, you know, the majlis of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is it's amazing how much knowledge it has given the followers of Ahl al-Bayt in the last thousand years. You know, these majalis which were held by Messrs Mufid and Saduq and so on, have provided people with phenomenal knowledge. And the majalis in different languages, in Arabic and Persian and Urdu and Turkish and so on, and now in the English language, have provided people with knowledge. Now, naturally can't say everything about a topic in in, in that one hour, you know, people want you to have a 10, 12 minutes on reminder of Karbala. And then, you know, a, any topic requires maybe five or 10 more discussions to look at the other sides of the arguments that you've posited and so on. However, I think, you know, learning through YouTube, that's one way. And always try and have a mentor who can verify what you've learned. Distance learning is now being offered by many uh, houses, both here and abroad, and I think distance learning is wonderful. 
you know, not everybody wants to become Mawlana X or Ayatollah Y, you know, or Sheikh Z, for example. People just want knowledge about their history, about Quran, about ethics, about law, about spirituality. And they're looking for a, a you know, in their, in their time, it's very hard to get free time. That, you know, there, there may be someone who is a mother to, you know, four kids and she's trying to find some time to just be able to study a subject. Nice distance learning, goes online, spends an hour every week and gains that knowledge. I think it's very something that deserves credit, deserves, you know, mention and is to be applauded. Very praiseworthy act that you're able to sign up so that you spare one hour out of 168 a week to just try and gain closeness to Allah through learning about what Ahlul Bayt have left behind. So let's not discount this distance learning because, oh, if you're going to do distance learning, you can never really be a scholar because there's no mubahda. Okay, but for some people, they just need that relationship to blossom again with the Quran or with the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wa salam. So what about those who are quite academically strong um, maybe have some experience. What about self-learning? Would you recommend this or do you think that no, it's best to have a mentor or a teacher? I don't think there's anyone out there who didn't have a moment of self-learning. But without a doubt, you need that specialist in the field who acts as a mentor for you. You know, in every Islamic science that I have studied and continue to study, there's always one expert I have a close relationship with who I can buffer my thoughts or gain knowledge from and proudly say this, not hide it. I wouldn't hide if I say that I gain knowledge from so-and-so or that I call so-and-so to help me when I'm preparing a lecture, verify should I include this section or shouldn't I? What do you think of this opinion? A mentor is fundamental. But for someone to discount being self-taught or self-learning, because you know there are some people who say, this person, for example, they, you know, they, they've just learned these things by themselves. Okay, we're all asked to try and go out there and get knowledge. The only difference or something that I would add is in your local community, there are normally very renowned scholars. And those renowned scholars try and go and meet them once a month and say, listen, I've studied the following. I'm not sure about the couple of issues. I'd be delighted if you could provide me with some guidance or with some advice. You know, when it came to, for example, issues uh, of, of, of Nahu and Sarf, you'll study under a teacher, but you're also happy to go and discuss whether you've got something right with people or not with different mentors in your life. I say, for example, myself, if I'm not sure about a certain issue, I'm debating the nahu or the sarf or a particular, you know, this particular sentence, I'm not sure, a particular wording or how the connections work. Sometimes I may even, I discuss it with my mother, for example, because I know how strong her nahu and sarf is. Sometimes I discuss it with someone like Sheikh Ayyub, because I know that he's very well trained in nahu and sarf. I remember, for example, when I was at Hawza, uh, Sheikh Ahmed, who was our teacher, without necessarily mentioning his surname, he, he was a fantastic teacher. But even when you're studying these, Mubahatha used to help refresh. And I think that's where, when you're in Najaf or Qom and that environment, there's that constant refreshing of those principles again. And Therefore, a mentor, if you are away from those environments, is fundamental. Yeah. Sayyidna, going to Najif, Qom, Karbla, will that guarantee that I get a very, very good education? I will come back very, very knowledgeable and an ideal leader for my community. I think it's great if you're able to go there already knowing people there or people who were there who you can take advice from as to what do I do when I get there? What should I look out for? Who are the teachers who are still there? Who, are who I'm able to get private lessons from? Because sometimes you've got the public lessons 
But there are some teachers who will tell you, we will also conduct private lessons. So, I think from one angle, there needs to be that due diligence that's done before you go there. There are many who went there expecting, I think there were some people who went there expecting that they were going to be in Jannah, in heaven. Because they hear so much Najaf Qom, or they went on one summer trip with a group of others and it was made to seem like this is the most amazing place you're ever going to see. And then you get there and you're like, okay, um, electricity wise, there's an issue there. That bathroom is about all to fall on me. Teacher turned up, but then this day he didn't turn up. Those students don't really like me. Why don't they like me? Mm, maybe my, because of who I follow is different to who they follow. This is for some political things as well. But if you can overcome these things with the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then hopefully you'll do well. Inshallah. So now we have a caller. Inshallah, we've tested the system. It's working. We know for sure it's working. Inshallah, Inshallah we'll be able to get the questions. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum. Mashallah. Your question, please, for the Sayyid. Um, my question is for the Did you get any of that? Uh, so much for sorting out the phones. You know, let, can you, let, sorry, brother, can you, can, you, can you say that again? Let the, the, brother, really let the brother write in their message until we sort out the phones. Yeah, go sure. ahead. Um, I do have some questions actually on the phones as you say that. Um, this is a good one here. I would like to learn more on Quranic Tafsir. Which one do you recommend for me to learn at my own pace at home? Oh, tafsir of the Holy Quran. Well, there's, there's some classics, but I, I would say... Uh, I would say when it comes to the world of Tafsir, you've either got uh, some classics from the earliest period of the Greater Occultation, like the Tabian of Sheikh Al-Tusi, for example. Then you've got, for example, of the recent texts, I would say Sheikh Muhammad Jawad Mughniya's Tafsir of the Qur'an, as well as uh, Abdullah Shubbar's Tafsir of the Qur'an. Those are two fantastic Tafsir of the Holy Qur'an. I'm not sure if they're translated in the English language. Uh, many of these tafasir are in the Arabic language. I don't think, I may be wrong, I don't think there's a whole tafsir of the Holy Quran translated into English except an enlightening commentary of the Holy Quran by Faqih Imani. An enlightening commentary, about 20 volumes, an enlightening commentary of the Holy Quran by Faqih Imani. But I would say, you know, Sheikh Muhammad Jawad Mughniya's Tafsir of the Holy Quran is, uh, is an admirable work, yeah. Sayyidina, we have loads of different sciences, such as, which we find really important in today's world politics, sociology. Um, is there room for this in Islam? Has Islam ever discussed anything like political science? Is there, is there room for it in Islam or is there room for it in our traditional centers of learning? In Islam, there's definitely room for it. In Islam, if Islam is not discussing, you know, politics and, you know, and the way a government is run and how it safeguards the interests of people and how it regulates laws within society, then it can't be called a way of life. Um, and I think that's where someone like Sayyid Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr was uh, guiding us towards when he began to discuss, you know, the political system of the religion of Islam, the economic system of the religion of Islam, how society grows in the worldview of the Qur'an. Uh, so I think that, that definitely can be in the future a module, you know, on, on Islamic political theories. I think that needs to be a module definitely in the Hausa in the future. Inshallah. Say that we have another caller on the line. Shall we be able to get through? Assalamu alaikum, your name and where are you calling from? Assalamu alaikum, salam. Um, Sayyid Ammar and Sayyid Mohsin. Uh, we're calling from Sweden. MashaAllah. Uh, 
or Christian here is uh, if it's written anywhere in the Quran or Hadith about the so-called vision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what I mean by this is can you take knowledge from vision? Uh, we have a brother who is uh, feel the presence of Imams and the uh, Prophet in his dreams and we're concentrating on prayer. Um, and we also like uh, to thank you for your work for the community. May Allah hopefully with the blessings and link in your life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, brother. Thank you for your question and inshallah Allah give you the tawfiq to gain more knowledge inshallah. Sayyidina. There are people out there who will, will say that they have been illuminated through Mukashafa, for example, or Kashf, where there is a particular guidance that's given to them um, because of a particular incident or a dream, for example, that they may have had. I know that there are certain scholars who have discussed, for example, the ability to do an istikhara is very much related to a certain spiritual insight that's been given to certain people. You know, there are some scholars who say not anyone can do an istikhara, for example. You know, some people today will go on the internet, istikhara, and then if it comes out, yes, they'll move on. No, there, there's meant to be a spiritual connection. And they'll say that there are certain people who have being illuminated. The problem with that is it becomes, you go into this very relative zone where two people who claim that they've had a particular vision, a spiritual insight, a spiritual mystical moment, one says that I was illuminated by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. The other says I was illuminated by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. And they despise each other. So we're a bit <laughs> uncertain. Hold on a minute. Is, is I, the, what is going on? Is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, telling you to, to despise each other or are both of you misinterpreting what you've seen? Or is there not even a vision but you're just trying to sanctify what you're telling the people through claiming to have had these visions? And there are many people out there who will, who will misguide because they've reached a level of popularity from being able to say these things, they'll end up misguiding. From those people out there who ended up going towards the world of seeking help from the jinn. Uh, what does the ayah in the Quran say? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kana rijalun min al-insi ya'udhuna bi rijalin min al-jinni. Wazaduhum rahaqa. The Quran says that there were, you know, some of the men who used to come towards the jinn seeking help. So there are people out there who will actively go seek help from the jinn so that they're able to, you know, have this spiritual power over people. And then there are others, no, it could be just blatant lies where they, you know, may have had a particular moment of spiritual, uh, you know, illumination and now they believe that it affects every judgment that they make. So we'd stay away from such things. So I have some questions there from Facebook. Uh, we have uh, someone <coughs> here from... The USA, American convert here. One issue I have with reading the Quran is constantly being told that I'm not smart enough to know what it says. I'm not a scholar who has spent her entire life studying it, therefore I cannot possibly understand any of it. It is very disheartening, causes me to react in a, uh, in a way, why bother? No, I think uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that knowing the original meaning and the different layers of meaning behind the verses of the Qur'an is a knowledge with him and those who he has chosen. You know, ultimately we need to go back to the, you know, to the discussions of Ahlul Bayt salam, on every ayah of the Holy Qur'an. And that's where these books of tafasir are there. So don't get, you know, disheartened by people telling you you can't. Rather, just go out looking for the texts um, which allow you to understand that particular chapter of the Holy Qur'an. So, you know, we have another question coming in, and it's in regards to the jurisprudential side of Islam. Are there any authors or any books that you actually do recommend to, the, to those who want to study? In terms of jurisprudence, there's a few scholars who I will say personally that I'm indebted to because of their texts. Sheikh, once again, Muhammad Jawad Mughniya, for his fantastic works on fiqh and usul. 
um, in my opinion, one of the best structured works on the principles of jurisprudence um, is his work uh, which looks at usul from a, you know, from this, with this wonderful title, the Thawb al Jadid. You know, it's a very, it's very interesting work to look at. And his work looking at the five schools of Islamic law and how they reach their conclusions. I would say Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, may Allah bless his soul. His fantastic works, especially the halaqat, they really provide you with an analysis of why we need to study principles of jurisprudence. And the first volume of the halaqat is translated into English, been translated twice into English. Uh, Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr definitely within the halaqat is able to provide us with an understanding of how principles of jurisprudence allow us to understand the process of istimbat. Istimbat in its original meaning is that when you, you know, when you take a water out of a well, you know, you're going mm -hmm. deep to try and find um, that purity, that source, that understanding of law. I would say as well, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hadi al-Fadli, may Allah bless his soul. Uh, his introductory text, Sheikh Muhammad Adar Mudaffar, his, his texts in, in, in you know, the principles of jurisprudence. These are fantastic works um, when it comes to Ilm al usul and to, when it comes to their fiqh works. So I hope that would suffice in terms of, um, in terms of scholars, Sayyid Hussein al Mudarrasi, as well uh, at Princeton. You know, his introduction to the, you know, development and history of Islamic law, absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So those are people I would recommend for sure. Yep. sure. Excellent, excellent. Another question here coming from um, one of the viewers is that I would like to get involved more into hadith studies. Is there anything you'd uh, recommend for me that I can delve in in regards to hadith? In terms of hadith, I would recommend starting off with introduction to hadith studies, Sheikh Abdul Hadi al-Fadli again, may Allah bless his soul. Yeah, I studied that book. Yeah. Sheikh Abdul Hadi al-Fadli, his introductory texts are always concisely written. Whether it's ilm al-usul, whether it's understanding how hadith studies develops, that would definitely be the first area I would delve into. My uncle, uh, the you know, the renowned scholar of Najaf, Sheikh Baqir al-Irawani, uh, his works... Oh, he's your uncle? Oh, yeah. sure. I'm, I'm studying his Fiqh Istidlali at the moment. There you go. So Fiqh yeah. Istidlali, Sheikh Baqir al-Irawani, definitely. Uh, but not being translated in English, has it? It well, has. It has? Oh, no. Sheikh Ayyub Rashid's teaching me that Arabic to English. He's translating for us. He's translating, it's okay. It's in Arabic. So okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Sheikh Baqir al-Irawani's work, Al-Fiqh Istidlali, as well as his work, on the hadith and rajal studies as an introductory text. Um, as well as I'm sure he has a work translated into English recently on legal maxims. Yeah, Prince, yeah, yeah. yeah. He does, he does, yeah as yeah. well, I, you know, Ashwala Sarfala Milani has a work um, also on uh, principles of jurisprudence. So on hadith, I would say that definitely starting off with Sheikh Abdul Hadi al-Fadli. Yeah. Yeah, so. Another question here from the WhatsApp. Assalamu alaikum Sayyid Amar. I'm 18 from Croatia. Uh, this year, inshallah, I'm about to study Islamic history in the holy city of Qom. I would ask you for some advice about quality spending time and how to get used to the academic system from your experience and your point of view. Yeah, well, if you're going there to study history, um, you know, I don't think history is seen as a main subject. So most probably she's going there to study at a particular institute um, and you know try as much as possible to see uh, if you could get time to study other subjects while you're there. Um, I don't think you only have to focus history, I think it's a great opportunity for you to see uh, the development of theology or the development of hadith or the development of law while you're there as well. Um, and there are, you know, brothers and sisters there who have studied in the West and are studying there. Maybe you can uh, gain some advice from them while you're there as to which institutes or which seminars are held where you are able to also see other subjects that are being studied. Yeah. 
So no, we have a question here. It's, it's from a sister in Birmingham, and she's asking, what is the best age to start teaching children Islam? Maybe we can go into a bit more depth of what should we teach young children who probably, let's say, eight years old, ten years old. What should we start? You know, what should we start teaching them? And then, you know, when, when is a good age? For well, them in for? first seven years, you know, just let them enjoy the subject. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and then in the second seven, there could be a bit more of an understanding of you know the discipline. Um, that's needed for that child's life in the next seven years. You know, tahara issues yes. and all the issues re regarding, you know, where there is ahkam uh, taklifiyah, you know, because all of a sudden within a couple of years, wajib and mustahab and, and um, mubah and makruh and haram all start coming into our lives. Um, and so between the age of seven and 14, there has to be a lot more focus but that focus shouldn't just be legal. I think sometimes we teach our children the legal structure so much that they begin to despise studying or learning about Islam because all they ever hear are the words haram, halal, haram, halal. I think sometimes teaching them anecdotes about the great personalities of the religion of Islam or about areas related to their everyday life um, in that 7 to 14 age um, range, I think has a profound effect for their love of religion. What we don't want to do is make our kids feel like what they're studying has nothing to do with their life or what they're studying is done in such a way that doesn't allow them to express themselves. Yeah. Excellent. Another question. Marshall, we can get loads of questions in today. In recent times, we see that centers of research and knowledge creation has shifted from Islamic world to the West. What are the reasons for this? Have we failed as Muslims or did Islam not have a mechanism to sustain knowledge creation? Well, you know, at the end of the day, when we're looking at, um, at the demographic that's now in the West, we needed to build research centers. When we established the Imam Ali chair for Shia studies of the Hartford seminaries, because there is a demographic of Shia living in North America. When you're establishing, for example, the Islamic College for Advanced Studies, because there is a demographic of Shia living here, it doesn't show that there's a, you know, it's a negative on, uh, on your institutes of research. And we have some fantastic institutes of research um, in the Middle East that shouldn't be discounted. Just because people don't know about them doesn't mean that they do not exist. But to say that there seems to be a lot more learning in the West happening, no, on the contrary, I think there's a demographic in the West. And therefore, because of that, there are new centers of research and institutes to meet the needs of that demographic. And there needs to be more as well. So we've, we've had a lot of discussion and we've been talking about different uh, you know, books and, and, and uh, routes to find knowledge. I think it's very important that we discuss for people who are interested in Islam and, and the Jafri Fiqh, especially those who want to inquire. Mm. Um, where should they start? Should they look at you know, things like the theology, theological books or ilm kalam as we say? Or is there something you could recommend that, you know what, if you want to get a basic understanding of what Shia Islam is and, 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 its, and its principles and um, its laws, what would you recommend to those people who are inquiring about the religion? I think getting those people to meet a scholar in the community is vital. Because, like the sister said, who was a revert sister to the religion, even when you open some of these books without having that expert next to you, you may misunderstand a particular concept. So if anyone has a non-Muslim friend who wants to learn more about Islam, either they can be the ones who can answer their questions, or they can take them towards an expert in the community. Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of scholars Wherever we may be, whether if you're living in London or the brothers who are living in Sweden or you're living in North America or you're living in Australia or in Canada, we have a number of scholars there. Try and make an appointment with those scholars and let them have a discussion. So I believe we have a caller on the line. Inshallah, we'll be able to get through. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Your name and where you're calling from? Wa alaikum as Sayyid We had the calling from Sweden. MashaAllah again. Another question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we're coming, uh, we had a question about the 12 Imams. Inshallah, the uh, same will be able to answer it. Fire away. Uh, we know they have the option to uh, make a sin, but they choose not to. Uh, but uh, the question here, the fundamental question that we have is, what does it say in either the Hadith or the Quran? Jazakallah uh, khair. Thank you very much for your question. Infallibility, Hadith and Quran. 
Well, I think if you're looking within the Holy Quran, the clearest ayah for the infallibility, the error-free household of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is Surah 33, verse number 33, which is known as Ayat al-Tathir. So that ayah would be uh, from the Quran. Um, and of course, the fact that the Holy Prophet leaves behind the Quran and his Ahlul Bayt and tells us that if you hold on to them, you will never go astray. We know the Quran is infallible. Whatever's alongside it has to be infallible. And that through rationally, we reach the conclusion that those who are appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those who are protected from error and those who are uh, following the guidance um, and protecting the religion on behalf of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. So if you're looking from the Quran, then you would go to Ayat al tathir And uh, if you're looking from Hadith, then you have, for example, many a Hadith, which we can go into and we have gone into into other shows. But I would say, you know, Hadith al-Thaqalain. I leave behind for you the Quran and my Ahl al-Bayt. Hold on to them and you will never go astray. That means that both of them are infallible sources of guidance for us. Excellent. So then we're coming to the end of our show. Just a final question I wanted to ask you was, in regards to our centers here in the West, are, are they doing enough to you know, spread knowledge and to help others gain knowledge? Maybe they could act as an you know, intermediate between the houses in the, in the East and, and people here. Or maybe they can hold their own workshops and lessons in, in, in London here. I think originally when these centers were built, a lot of credit has to go to the founding fathers who wanted a place where we could, co uh, community could come together, we could congregate, where we could have majalis and so on. And I think now we're reaching a stage where tut tutorials are vital, seminars are vital, question answer sessions are vital. Even uh, a mini hausa for men and women of the community is also vital. And I see wonderful work being done um, in the Western world on that front, where many of the resident alims are working the hardest. And those who maybe are not giving classes on hadith or on history on Quran, then it's up to the community to go to them and for them to uh, tell them that we would be delighted if you would hold a short course on the Quran or a short course on hadith or a short course on Islamic law. And he, as the resident alim of the community, with so many years of studies behind him, um, or her, because we need the resident alimas and resident alims. Um, hopefully, we'll provide the guidance. Inshallah. I feel sometimes that, you know, the resident alim, and, and what I mean in London, sometimes they're a bit reluctant to, to you know, um, teach, reluctant to step forward, because there is a lot of time and a lot of effort that is required in order to pass on knowledge. And sometimes, you know, it would be, I think it's courteous, and I think it's very well that if we were to send people to learn from a, a mu'ammameen, we should pay them. If you're going to get your, your son or daughter tutored from, from someone, you'll definitely be, be you know, putting money out of your pocket. So I think it should be the same. I find it interesting you know. that you're using, you know, you're using the word um, when we have to go to Mu'ammameen. So that literally translated to our viewers is we have to go to turbans, um, you know, uh, or those who wear turbans. And I think what you're really saying, we have to go to those people who are our ulama, yes. you know. Um, Again, once again, it's, it, there's this thing which is, it's as if it's part of our <laughs> nature, it's become that, you know, the dress is fundamental for me. Is the beard nice and white? And does that person look like he's around the 7th century of Arabia? Therefore, that person is the one I'll gain knowledge from. And I think that what's fundamental for us is to be able to go and sit with them and tell them, listen, there's about 10, 15 of us, and we'd be delighted if we can all come and sit together and learn from you. And I'm sure if they see that passion, then I'm sure they're going to be of those who... Um, who are going to be wanting to teach us, inshallah. Yeah. Definitely. Final question. Sayna, what was your favorite topic in Hawza? What did you enjoy studying? Um, I would say, uh, Ilm al Usul. Yeah, Ilm al Usul, wonderful subject. Um, and I can't say it was, it continues to be my favorite subject. Principles of jurisprudence. Um, it really takes you to the core and understanding of law. Yeah, and Excellent. understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace and mercy in the way he has not left a single area without providing us with guidance. Yeah. Mine was always aqaid. <laughs> I really aqaid. enjoyed that. Yeah, interesting. Final point for the viewers, Sayyid Nazri. Just, you know, um, try and make use of your time, you know, your spare time. 
before you know it, you know, make use of your youth before your old age, make use of your uh, health before illness, make use of that wealth that you have before um, you are in a state of poverty, and try and look for those people of knowledge. More important than their ilm is their hikmah, the wisdom that they have. Yep. Thank you, Sayyidina, for an enlightful discussion. Thank you. Inshallah, you'll be joining the Sayyid again on the next episode where we'll discuss a new topic and take your questions in live. Until then, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh.